the military series is brought to you by micro gains and dominion strength you know both are longtime friends and sponsors of the barbell logic podcast both companies are true small businesses american owned and 100 percent of all their products are made here in the united states for the finest quality fractional plates, visit microgains.com. That's with a Z, microgains with a Z.com. And for the highest quality leather belts, artisanal, handcrafted, but heavy duty belts, all with a lifetime warranty, go to dominionstrengthtraining.com. Both use discount code LOGIC for a significant discount off their products exclusively for Barbell Logic listeners. Welcome, everyone, to the Barbell Logic Military Series. I'm your host, Nikki Sims, along with host Matt Reynolds. Before we begin, we'd like to say that the views expressed in this series do not necessarily represent those of the Department of Defense or the United States government. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is Matt Reynolds, and I'm here again with our good friend, Colonel Scott Conway, Colonel in the Marines. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. We want to talk today, I know something about you're, you're really passionate about, is the ideas of leadership and resilience. And I think first off, you know, everyone that's listening to this military series has heard your story now, but briefly fill us in again, just a little bit on your path to leadership, path to colonel, your kind of promotions over the course of the years in the Marines and what that's been like. So we won't bring in the fitness aspect of it yet. Let's talk just a little bit about your path to leadership and what that looked like for you. And then we'll start to pull out some truths that you've learned along the way. Okay. So I am a native son of Baltimore, Maryland. Naval Academy is right down the street in Annapolis, Maryland. And I watched my brother go through uh, and went to a relatively small high school and did average things there. But I managed to get into the Naval Academy prep school. So I was on the five-year program. It took me just a little bit longer. But I'm a 93 graduate of the Naval Academy. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps in 1993. And, you know, from there, I've held a wide variety of billets, both in the operational forces. I worked at Officer Candidate School, which was a tremendous opportunity for about three years. I've got two combat tours in Iraq, two combat tours in Afghanistan. I did two years over in Okinawa working government and external affairs, which uh, was probably the most challenging job. We can get into that later if you would like, or just leave it alone. I'm okay with either <laughs> one. And then... I also commanded both as a lieutenant colonel in an aviation unit. It was an aviation ground support. And then I commanded again as a colonel 2017 to 2019. So it's been a pretty wild ride over the last 20, almost 28 years, but it has been worth it every step of the way. You got in what year again? What'd you say, 93? So I graduated high school in 88, and that's when I went to the Naval Academy Prep School okay. up in Newport, Rhode Island. So the prep school, is that like a second senior year? Or was that your senior year? No. So my senior year in high school was 88. And the prep school is made for people who need just a little bit more. It's like, you know, warming up before a workout. Sure. O five O. 5 I needed warm up before college. Yeah, that makes sense. And so that entire process was five years long. So 88 to 93. That's yep. when you graduated from the Naval Academy. And so one, one year in Newport, and then I went down to Annapolis, Maryland in 89, uh, and then graduated from there in 93. So one year old, let's talk about that. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 well, there's a part of this that I think is actually sort of, yes, funny, but important is that it takes a long time to really walk through enough life and enough wisdom and enough tours and to be able to gain that leadership experience and get those promotions we're not talking to a 27 year old kid about leadership and resilience in the military. Like there's a reason we're talking to a guy who's got some age on him. Thank you for calling me old. I do appreciate that. <laughs> well, you're older than me. So I get, fair enough. When you're running my company and I'm like older than everybody else by 10 years, it's nice to talk to somebody that's older than myself. I know your pain. Trust me. <laughs> the longer you stay in, the fewer and fewer peers you have. So but no, the jobs that I hold today and the one that I just left down in North Carolina, you know, they are jobs that I would not have been capable of doing in 93, 97, even, you know, 2005. It's just, it's a cumulative experience. Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting for me, you know, I really started as a strength coach and then owned a gym and thought that 
I sort of knew what leadership was and I had no clue what leadership was. And as time has gone on and the company has grown, we're a corporation and I'm more of a CEO. I really enjoy that aspect. That's really what brings me joy. I still love to coach, but the leadership piece of this is actually the thing that is the most challenging to me and therefore the most fun. I mean, I take it really serious. And, and in talking to you, I get the feeling it's the same thing. There was a challenge there for you to continue to be a better leader over the years. Is that fair? Absolutely. And, you know, you have to realize very early on, if you're going to accomplish any success in the Marine Corps, the rule number one is it's not about you. It's never about you. Sure. Uh, it's all about your people. It, it's about the mission. You know, we, we say mission first, Marines always. So it's leadership. And it's ironic that you said it that way, because we actually have a Marine Corps warfighting publication that says leadership is a sacred responsibility and a tremendously rewarding experience. Yep. It is the most serious thing that we do. Yes. Uh, in, in the Marine Corps and in any branch of service for that matter. So let's go back to one of the early promotions that you had. Is there one that sticks out in your mind as being like, this was either A, unexpected or B, it took a tremendous, it felt like I was overcoming a tremendous hurdle in one of these early promotions. Can you think back? I know that's way back there in like the Reagan administration and whatnot, but <laughs> no, it's, in those early years, what was one of the first big ones that sticks out to you? So, I mean, obviously commissioning, that's the biggest deal. I spent five years in two different locations, you know, overcoming academic challenges, overcoming physical challenges, overcoming, you know, all of the frustrations and the joys that come with going through college. But, you know, it's the Naval Academy, so it's kind of like not college. Sure. But, you know, for me, I cannot imagine any other path. So commissioning was the day that I will never forget when I was commissioned a second lieutenant. But when you are a junior officer, that more of a Navy term, but, you know, junior officers, but when you're a second lieutenant and a first lieutenant, there is, you're really on the learning side of things. Your job is the lowest ranking officer, but yet almost the biggest amount of responsibility because not only do you have to execute your missions, you have to learn about everything that makes you a subject matter expert. Nobody cares where you went to school. Nobody cares what you did before. All they care about is what you do when you're there in the moment. But there's a way that people, that some Marines, they look at second lieutenants and first lieutenants. It's like, okay, well, you're still not trying out for the team because you're commissioned officer in the Marine sure. Corps. And that's, that's a tremendous honor. But when you get promoted to captain, you're sitting at the table, you know, you go from, you know, even just the rank insignia, it's not that single bar anymore. It's, it's the railroad tracks. But when you're promoted to captain, there's just something about it that, you know, you can, it doesn't matter if you just pinned it on or if you're getting ready to pin on major, you just, it feels good to walk around as a captain. And for me, that coincided with the time frame that I had one of my most rewarding jobs, which was officer candidate school, where I was helping pick future leaders in the Marine Corps. So I have to say that that was probably my favorite promotion and the favorite job that I've had. I mean, they're all great. It's like picking a favorite child. You know, they're all great, but that one stands out sort of above all the others. So if we go to that, you have a pretty big responsibility at that point of seeing non-officers and seeing the cream rise to the top. What was that leadership position like? What were you looking for and what made somebody stand out and what were some of the lessons learned there? where you're effectively, I think, helping someone down a new path, a, a better path for them to be able to make them an officer. And you're talking about specifically about officer candidate school, right? Yeah, when you were there and you were, now you've got all these, I don't know, you've got these Marines, quote unquote, kids. I mean, they're younger, right, in general, and you're seeing who are the ones that are sticking out. Like, what are some of those lessons learned where you were, you could see that, I mean, at this point, you've got how many people underneath you as captain? So as a platoon commander at officer candidate school, the platoons were generally 50. Okay. Yeah. So I had 50 candidates in a company that was anywhere from 150 to 250, depending on the cycle of the year. Okay. So at the time they're called candidates, not to get too technical, but there are some prior enlisted Marines that come through, but when they come mm -hmm. to officer candidate school, they're candidates because they're a candidate to become an officer of Marines, a second lieutenant of Marines. And depending, again, on the specific program that you come in, it is either a six-week period or a 10-week period that they're there that we have to train, evaluate, and screen them for future potential as leaders in the Marine Corps. It is sensory overload sure. because we have our drill instructors, you know, the same drill instructors that are in Paris Island and Marine Corps Recruiting Depot, San Diego. They also come to Quantico, where the school is, and they are very effective at their job. And their job is to create a chaotic and uncertain environment. 
And I don't want to say that the system is designed to push people to failure because that sounds intentional and that's not what it is. The system is designed to basically teach the candidates enough to evaluate them and place them in chaotic and uncertain environments and see how they react. It is inevitable that people are going to fail while they're there. It just, it is the way it happens. It may come on everyone, training. everyone, someone's going Every to fail. Every single person is going to fail. And I don't necessarily mean like you're going to fail a test or you're going to fail a physical fitness test or an academic test. What I'm saying is you are going to make a mistake. You know, some people make bigger mistakes than others and it may come on training day one. It may come on training day 42. You know, it just, it's uncertain when it's going to happen. What I tried to do was I didn't care about the failure because it was going to happen to everyone. I wanted to see, now what? So you, candidate Reynolds, have just failed. What are you going to do? Because to me, that is a better measure of an individual and their leadership potential than the failure that put them in that situation in the first place. So because you're trying to see and identify if these candidates have what it takes to be a leader, an officer, how much teaching slash coaching were you doing with the candidates versus just observing and sort of letting people fail and see if they could do this on their own? How much help is there from their leadership, from their officers? So there's a very special relationship that candidates and any former candidates going to laugh when I say that there's a very special relationship between candidates and their drill instructors, whether it's, you know, the platoon sergeant, the sergeant instructor, the different ranks. That, and there's usually three, three drill instructors per platoon. And then you've got the platoon commander. So that's the staff right there. There's four people. There is an entire academic section that teach the material, the, the classroom instruction and everything. And then there are other organizations in the school that are designed to help you out with the logistic support of your field training exercises, et cetera. So, I mean, there is a tremendous support network. The job of the drill instructors and the platoon commander, there's almost sort of a inversely proportional relationship. At the very beginning, the platoon commander kind of sits back and watches because what I'm doing is I'm looking for all those reactions. I'm looking for how people respond in the face of adversity. As the program goes on, the platoon commander gets a little bit more involved. So the motto of the school is ductus exemplo, which Latin for leadership by example. So my job as a platoon commander is to set the example that the candidates eventually want to work towards and hopefully become someday. How hard was it to live up to those standards? How tough were those standards? You're always on. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you are just driving on to the grounds of officer candidate school or if you're driving away. Uh, but if you're at OCS, you're in the game. And it doesn't matter what section you're in. You could be in the logistics section. But if you're walking around and you're wearing that uniform and you're wearing the rank on the uniform, you're always on. So the pressure to set that example was, I don't want to say it was difficult because, I mean, we're always doing that as Marines. You know, we're always trying to lead by example. Sure. But when you've got 50 officer candidates watching every move, you may think that you're just in the back of the classroom while they're being instructed, but there are eyes on. So, and that's just, you know, from walking around when it came time for, you know, the physical training sessions. You know, it's not enough for me just to get out there and survive. I had to be out there and thrive. Lead the pack. Absolutely. Right. And did most of those other officers, I assume the answer would be yes. Did they attack it the same way you did? I mean, is that pretty much part of the culture there is that the instructors are like, look, we have to lead the pack. We have to be leaders. We have to be on 100% of the time. Is that very common? Or can you even see a fair amount of delineation among the leadership there at a place like OCS? No. So, I mean, there's, like I said, it's never about you. It, it's always about the Marines. And there was really nothing special about me because it was a shared mentality. And all of my peers that were there, all the fellow platoon commanders, the men and women that led these officer candidates, we all had the same approach. We wanted to put our best foot forward because we wanted to show those candidates, this is what it takes you know, if you want to come, you know, work with us, this is what it takes. If you want the honor to lead our Marines, you had best be at the top of your game. So now obviously within the school, the school picks who they want in the training companies. If somebody were to show up at the school that they didn't necessarily feel they wanted to put out in front, they wouldn't do that. But that, I mean, I can't remember a scenario where that was the case. Sure. So when you go there, 
there are some written and unwritten things that you know that you're expected to get bigger, faster, stronger. And like the motto is, lead by example. Perform. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's interesting. And for me, having no military background experience, I'm always trying to tie it back to how similar is it to leadership in the business world? Or And I recognize that the culture is different, but what it really still comes down to, it feels like, is that there are all these actions that the candidates have to do, perform physical fitness stuff, academic stuff that, you know, all this stuff. But ultimately it's about the culture. It's about the buy-in. It's about, this is who we are. And you're trying to see if these candidates are a fit for the culture. I mean, ultimately, isn't that what we're trying to do here? It is. The Marine Corps is unique in the services. And of course, I'm going to say that because I've been one for 28 years, but the Marine Corps has one standard. You know, we don't bend the standards. We don't lower the standards. We publish the standards. And then our job is to meet them and strive to exceed them. And, you know, we do recruit, but more often than not, it's just the mentality of people that are drawn to the Marine Corps. It's like, okay, that's the standard, but what's the best? Sure. Because I don't just want to meet the standard. I want to be the best in what it is that I'm doing and what we are trying to do. And And like I said, there's one standard in the Marine Corps and that we enforce, and that's the Marine Corps standard. So when we are working at officer candidate school, when we're picking those future leaders, you know, we're looking for people. Did they meet the standards? Yes. And then we obviously rank them as far as who exceeded and how well they did. We teach them our leadership traits and principles. And, you know, the school is not to pick the best second lieutenant. It's to pick someone who has the potential to be a great second lieutenant. Sure. So everyone that graduates OCS graduates as a second lieutenant. Is that correct? Some people don't take the commission. Right. Some people finish OCS and they get their certificate of completion and they say, thank you. No, thank you. We thank them for their time for sticking out the program. But generally speaking, if you are at OCS and you complete the program successfully, they go on to be second lieutenants. And what percentage of the candidates actually complete the program? Is it a fairly high percentage or is it You know, that's going to vary from platoon to platoon. And there is no quota. Sure. I can tell you that for sure. If I had a platoon of 50 and I graduated 50, as long as they met the standards, the Marine Corps would say, great. If I had a platoon of 50 and 34 of them uh, graduated because 34 of them met the standards, the Marine Corps would say, great. So generally speaking, like I said, it's not designed for people to fail. Sure. It is designed to evaluate if they have what it takes to meet the standards. Sure. Yeah, I guess let me ask a more leading question. You don't I certainly don't. We want to be, always be careful to, you know, not call out anybody specific and keep people anonymous here that you've worked with. But can you think of a time where you did see somebody and they weren't a fit? They weren't a match and you had to sit down or somebody had to sit down and have that awkward conversation that said, this is not in the cards for you. What does that look like? So I wasn't the commanding officer of the school. I didn't uh, I didn't have the final voting authority, but I did have plenty of counseling sessions. But instead of saying you don't have what it takes, what we tried to do was say, here are the areas where you're falling short. Here are the areas that we think you need improvement. And here are the steps we think you need to take to achieve that level of improvement in order to meet the requirements. Sure. And some people... You know, some people failed academically. Some people couldn't meet the physical standards. And OCS is very difficult from a physical performance perspective. And I don't just mean like out on a physical fitness test, but it's just event after event after event. Sure. It's very easy to get worn down. And when you're physically worn down, you're not as mentally sharp as you would have been had you been well rested to be well tested. So, but like I said, they could either fall short academically, they could fall short physically, or they could just decide this isn't for me and they could drop on their own request. Sure. Makes sense. And I thanked them. You know, there were no hard feelings. They came, they gave it their best. And we were working from five o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night with these candidates. I knew everything about them. Sure. And I could see who was phoning it in and who was really trying. You said sometimes it was six weeks, sometimes it was 10. What identified or what made it one or the other? Okay, so if somebody who goes through a Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps program, so they are going through, going to a college, kind of like the job that I'm in right now, where they're in uh, the NROTC program, where they're getting a lot of those classes, they're getting a lot of that training. Okay. They don't need a full 10-week experience. Got it. Whereas somebody that may have graduated from a college that has no military experience, they would go through a 10-week program. Got it. And this is OCS, I apologize for being ignorant in this, this is boot camp or basic, but on another level on steroids, basically, because it's for officers specifically or no? That is a very 
great question and a difficult one to ask. Okay. So when Marines graduate from boot camp, they graduate as basically trained Marines, hence the term basic training. When officer candidates graduate from officer candidate school, they graduate as second lieutenants. And in the Marine Corps, we send them on to an additional school, which is called the basic school. Oh. And so we have a saying in the Marine Corps, every Marine a rifleman. And for our officers, it doesn't matter if you're a pilot, if you're a logistician, or if you're an infantry officer, every officer is a platoon commander. So basically at the basic school, you, <laughs> no pun intended, you learn how to be that infantry platoon commander. Sure. And there's a lot of other things that the school covers. It's anywhere from six to eight months, depending on what time of year you go through the school. So, okay, that makes sense. So OCS, you'll have people that'll come through OCS that don't have any experience, military experience, came out of college or whatever, and they go through the 10 week OCS. And then after OCS, they actually go back and do the basic, the basic school. Yes. And learn the foundational art of being a soldier. Yes. Essentially an infantryman. So, I mean, we've had Marines that are prior enlisted that came from, you know, one day they were gunnery sergeant Conway, and then they go to officer candidate school. They graduate from officer candidate school. They're now second Lieutenant Conway. By the way, I was not a gunnery sergeant and I apologize if anyone thinks that I was saying <laughs> that. You know, they were a gunnery sergeant before, they went through OCS, they became second lieutenant, and then they went to the basic school where they learned the very fundamental aspects of being a second lieutenant. And then they go on to their specialty school where they learn how to become a logistics officer or okay. a flight school or infantry officers course. Okay, so I wanna take the next step forward for you on the leadership timeline, really. And can you identify a place specifically when you were still here in the States, that was a challenging but potentially rewarding leadership position that you had? And what were some of the lessons that you learned there post OCS, right? But, and I definitely want to talk a little bit about your tours for sure, because I'm sure there were a tremendous amount of lessons that could be learned there as well. But can you pull out a couple of those big picture leadership lessons from when you were still here? I mean, literally, I have stories for days, as does any Marine, because there's only one thing we like to talk about more than being a Marine. It's working with Marines. Um, <laughs> so I was very fortunate to be selected as the commanding officer for that aviation ground support command. I was a lieutenant colonel, and we had approximately 500 ballpark Marines and sailors. So I had both Marines and sailors in the command. And this, I mean, this is varsity stuff here. So you are the commanding officer. Before I was a platoon commander at officer candidate school, and then I worked my way up to company executive officer. So I was second in command of the company. Now I am the commanding officer as a lieutenant colonel of, you know, like I said, 500 Marines and sailors. And I am responsible for everything that the command does or fails to do. And that means when those Marines distinguish themselves in a good way, you know, I pushed all the credit to them. When the Marines and sailors distinguished themselves in a negative way, I assumed all that responsibility on sure. myself. The so Eisenhower method, right? Absolutely. Praise in public, reprimand in private. That's right. What were some of the biggest challenges that you had there? I mean, can you be specific enough? Can you think of a time that it was like, man, this was hard. This was, I'm not sure that I was ready for this, or there were times that you had to really, like you were stressed about. It. I mean, there have to be some times as leadership, especially when you've got this many guys who have dedicated their careers. And again, it's not just a career, right? You're not just doing this for a paycheck to buy groceries for your family. You are representing right. the United States of America. And so if there's a whole nother level of gravity to it, can you think of a time that's like, man, this was, this was tough, but in the end was rewarding? Uh, yes. So I took command right after that unit had returned from about seven months in Afghanistan. So as is often the case when units come back, there is, you know, an order cycle that happens, you know, and every year the Marine Corps, about a third of the Marine Corps is moving, you know, changing jobs, et cetera. So I took command and in my job, I had it for two years. And they had just come back from Afghanistan. So those who stayed in the command after that deployment, you know, there's a sense of camaraderie mm. and a connection to their former commanding officer who they went to combat with. And then there were the new Marines and sailors that rotated in, like me, did not have that same camaraderie. So at the same time, there were a couple of things that were going on. There were some investigations, you know, lost and missing equipment and all of the administration had to be wrapped up from things that happened 
at home station because not everybody went over to Afghanistan. There was a small element that stayed back. We were wrapping up administration from that group of people as well as, you know, getting everything resolved from the people who were coming back. So it was a big, lots of change. Let's just summarize it that way. So I had to establish credibility immediately and I couldn't do it as anything resembling the former commanding officer because mm. that would have been disingenuous. And at the time I was still, think about it, this was in 2010. So I was a lieutenant colonel. I'd been doing it since 1993. You'd think I knew a thing or two about a thing or two, but I was really still trying to figure some things out. Like, how am I going to command? So in my search for establishing rapport and establishing myself as a leader and representing these Marines and sailors, there was some growing pains that took place because they were getting used to me. I was getting used to them. And one of the things that I think finally brought us together, ironically enough, since we're here talking about working out, was working out and the program of physical training. And prior to that, in, in the intro, some of this was covered. Prior to that, you know, I was an endurance athlete and I had maintained a perfect physical fitness test score, you know, three mile run in under 18 minutes, 20 pull ups, and 100 crunches in two minutes. I had maintained perfect scores the whole time. And it, this was where things were starting to hurt. How old were you here at this point? This 2010, so I was 40. Okay. Yeah, yeah. infamous, that age. And I remember very distinctly this one physical fitness test, and it was, you know, I'm coming on the last part of the three-mile run, and one of my corporals, I still remember him to this day, we were kind of running-ish side by side, and that used to be where I wanted to be because that's when I got in someone's head because, I, you know, I wanted to win, sort of that drive. I don't sure. just want to be with the best. I want to be the best. But he started pulling ahead, and I couldn't catch him. And he just kept mm. getting further and further. And it didn't matter what I did. I couldn't catch him. So I lost a little bit of my identity as being, you know, the fastest because he didn't just beat me. He destroyed me. And I think for me, it was, okay, I've started building this rapport with the command because I'm physically fit, but now it's starting to hurt a lot more. I can't necessarily sustain that. But I was able, and not to cut to the end of the story, but I think over time, you know, we incorporated a lot of morale building things. And I think Marines are unique in that shared misery increases morale. Yep. You know, we did some field training exercises. We were given an opportunity to go to the Western Caribbean and do some pretty cool operational stuff on an amphibious ship. And I got to take about 300 Marines and sailors on board a ship and do some counter drug, counter narco terrorism stuff. And it was phenomenal the way that we came together as a team towards the very end. And when I, ironically enough, when I was doing my turnover with my replacement as a commanding officer, I said, you know, two years into this job, I think I just about am getting to the point where I'm comfortable doing it. Yeah. And it's time for me to give it up. <laughs> and is that when, well, let me back up for a second. So in that process, you started to really, I think, even in what you just said, sort of grasp what being a leader looked like, what being a, a successful leader in the Marines looked like. And again, that's probably not trying to put that on you specifically. This is why you're awesome. But more of what, when you think of an effective leader in the military, what are those things that you said, lead by example, is that the most important thing? Like, what are those things that you start to think about like that's made you a good leader, if we're going to assume that you are, and also the other leaders that you've had over the years, you go like, this was incredible about this person that really made them a great leader. So just a real quick distinction, because I don't want anyone who's listening to this to think the only leaders in the Marine Corps are commanders. We kind of joke that if two privates are walking down the street, one of them's got to be in charge. That's right. So the title I had was commanding officer. Anybody in the Marine Corps can be a leader. It's situationally dependent. It's all about context, time, place, and circumstance. So it doesn't matter if you're a corporal, if you're a gunnery sergeant, second lieutenant, or you know, even a you know, our lance corporals, there are some phenomenal leaders at all levels in the Marine Corps. When I was in command of that unit, that was the first time. I mean, I'd sort of been in leadership positions before, but this was the first time I had the Marine Corps designated title of commanding officer. So when you look at a Marine, 
as a leader, uh, you know, we have, like I said before, 14 leadership traits and 11 leadership principles. And, and for me, you know, it's difficult to say, you know, which one's the most important because they're all important. Do I want to have less knowledge or do I want to have less decisiveness? You know, I was going to say, what are some, you don't have to name all 14, but just for people who are listening that aren't familiar, what are a handful of those that are to give us an idea what those look like? Any Marine listening to this is going to laugh when I say JJ did tie buckle, right? That's how you remember it. That's our memory aid for our yep. leadership traits. So justice, judgment, dependability, initiative, decisiveness, tact, integrity, enthusiasm, bearing, unselfishness, courage, knowledge, loyalty, and endurance. That's JJ did tie buckle. So these are core values. That's what they are. I mean, again, it comes back to culture, right? Well, our core values, it's much simpler. There's only three of them, honor, courage, and commitment. Okay. Yes. So, you know, those three are sort of the foundation that, you know, leadership, the other 14 stem from really. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and the leadership principles, you know, I called out number five, set the example. And uh, that has been something that I've taken to heart throughout my entire career. So, but really what it comes down to is trust. So it's not one of the 14 leadership traits, trust, but if I don't establish trustworthiness as a leader, whether I was second Lieutenant Conway or Colonel Conway, no one's going to follow me. Mm. So I have to use all of the tools in the tool bag, and I have to specify my approach with each individual within the command, because not everybody's going to respond the same way. That's right. You're not going to build trust with each individual soldier in the same specific bucket, right? Like it's different. Like what buys that trust or what builds that trust with each individual soldier is going to be very different. Right. And there is a difference between soldiers and Marines, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. My vernacular's off. That's for all so, Marines. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to hear. Again, I connect this so much to what you're trying to do is help people be part of that culture. And I think if you hear those 14 leadership traits, I mean, who wouldn't want those things? What business wouldn't want that out of their employees? Absolutely. But like these are inarguable as being something that's extremely important and things that we should all strive for, whether we are Marines or soldiers or lay people. Right. The Marine Corps does not have a corner on the market of judgment and decisiveness intact. It's just we've packaged them in 14 leadership traits and principles with the very fancy in memory aid, JJ did tie buckle. The Army does the same thing. Air Force and Space Force, they have their version of this. And I would venture to say that General Electric has a version of, That's right. of their leadership traits, so whether it's their mission, their vision, or their guiding principles. Yep. I mean, same for us. It was one of the things that from the very beginning, that if you go back and talk to people like Nikki Sims or Andrew Jackson or people that have been with us that are on leadership now at Barbell Logic, one of the things I think they've communicated to me is that our what we called our core values, which was really more like the 14 things, it was a, a list of 10 major things that we were striving to be, and that in times when we had to make really hard decisions about, you know, maybe about making a little more money or about who we really were, we were able to come back to those basic tenant 10 things and say, is this who we are? And if right. the answer was no, then we didn't do it. So, you know, even one of those things, we constantly strive to choose rightly to do the right thing, whether it was best for us or not, or best for our pocketbook or not, best for the account or not. And there were lots of times that we had to choose rightly because it was right, not because it specifically put money in the bank account yep. of the business. And there's tons of carryover there, I'm sure. I couldn't agree more. You know, we try to be as leaders in the Marine Corps, and I'm going to throw that out. So everyone is involved, all, every single Marine, past, present, and future. We are firm, we are fair, and we strive to be consistent. Mm. And I think anybody would respond to that yeah. because that's what develops the trust. Yeah. There's some amount of predictability and some amount of comfort that you can have with somebody who is firm, fair, and consistent. Yeah, it's the way you should parent your kids. Absolutely. And it's not that you're looking at Marines like your children, but it's that's how you build trust even with your kids. I mean, one of the things that I have a daughter that's about to be 16, so everyone pray for me. And so she's driving, you know, and ready to get her license. But she told me about a year ago, six months ago, somewhere in there, she said, you know, um, she said we were talking about our relationship and, you know, how things were going. And she said, you know, she said, um, you're tough, you're hard to please. But she said, you know what I really like is that you always have a reason for why you ask something of me. I never, one of the things that really bothered me about my own, about my dad and my parents is that I often would get that 
they would tell me to do something or punish me or whatever. I would say, why? Like, like a rebellious kid does. Because I said and it so. Was, it was, yeah, because I said so, because I'm the emperor, because I'm your dad. And that's true. It's actually, it's not that that's not true, but I didn't feel like there was a major lesson to be learned there for me. I wanted to understand, was there logic in the decision? And, and I think when you build trust over time, I don't have to tell my kids every time now because they know that I think greatly about every decision I make, including parenting. And so that when I ask something of them, sometimes they say why, and I'll tell them, I'm like, this is the logical reason I'm asking you to do this. But now that trust is built, they often don't even ask me anymore because they know that dad has a reason for the thing. Right. I have so many things stacked up in my head as a result of that. And that's such a phenomenal parenting example. You can get away with because I said so exactly one time. Right. And then that round has left the chamber. That's right. Because it's not going to work as well. And there are times in the Marine Corps that I've got to rely on because I said so. You know, we can play sure. rock, paper, rank, you know, when it comes down to right. it. You know, one, two, three, I uncover my collars, you uncover yours. Oh, hey, you know, I'm the senior officer. But you can do it one time. And I only do that when absolutely necessary, when it is a time sensitive issue. But the most important aspect is that there's follow up. And when there is time, I go back. That's right. And I explain the why. That's right. Because and not because I owe it to them or whatever, but because I want to ensure that that foundation of trust is solid. And you talked about, you know, your daughter as an example, you know, our 13th commandant in the Marine Corps, General John A. Lejeune, he likened leadership and the relationship of leader and subordinate. He said, it's not superior and inferior. And I don't like those two terms because there's nothing inferior yeah. about a young enlisted Marine. And there's nothing superior about a 50-year-old colonel. Sure. I'm a senior officer, but I'm not a superior officer. But General Lejeune said the relationship between leader and led is much more of like a teacher and a scholar or a parent to a child. Mm. Our job is to educate and to build them up so that they can someday take these responsibilities. That's awesome. That's excellent. And so I'm going to assume that you spend a tremendous amount of time with these Marines trying to build that trust as a leader so that when you are put in a combat position, the trust is then built. And so that when you are in combat, when, you are, you know, when you're stationed overseas, what is that group of people called in the Marines? That's a company. Or what is that called typically? It's my favorite answer in all of the Marine Corps. It depends. It could be a squadron because okay. we have aviation in the Marine Corps. It could be a company in like the infantry. It could be a detachment in the logistics world. So yeah, okay. let's, let's just go so, with company. Let's go with a company. And is there a general word that people use in the Marines or in general that would identify? So when you're leading a group of Marines, whatever that is, a company. Let's just call it a small unit, small unit leadership. How important is it that you've already built that trust by the time you're in combat position? Right. It's life and death. Yeah. It's that important. You know, General Lejeune defined leadership in a number of different ways. But when you boil it down, it's not that difficult. Leadership is getting people to do what you need them to do, not because you told them, because you've inspired them to want to do it. It's art and science. The science of it is easy. You know, we can learn. I can memorize the 14 leadership traits. I can memorize the 11 leadership principles. That's the sciencey part. But it's the virtue of character, the habituation, and the repetition that you get in common, like I said, shared misery builds morale. And you do that through training. And when you train your Marines realistically, those young men and women, those heroes with whom you serve, when you've earned that trust, they'll follow the orders. And it's not a switch you can flip on. You know, they'll respect the rank. But that only gets you so far. Sure. They have to trust the leader, the individual. And that is that art portion that will get them to do the very difficult thing. Yeah, absolutely. To me, I think back about that parenting example. When your kids are younger, their entire life is controlled by you, right? And you can just put your thumb down on them if you want to. You can control with an iron fist. You can control your kids if that's what you want to do. But there is a day coming when you can't do that anymore. Like when your kid's 16 or 17 or 18 or moves out. And if you don't spend the previous 16 to 18 years building trust and building the relationship, then the day's going to come when they move out and they're never going to call back to home. They're never going to come back for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. And so we do the same thing as parents, but we do the same thing. I think this is why I hope that Marines and people in the military don't take offense to this, but I think it's why the culture and the lifestyle of the military is so 
attractive to parents who think about these things and to businesses. And I think it often gets tossed around like we're not in war. We're not in combat in the middle of trying to run business. We've had tough things that we've had to deal with and get lawsuits. That's not the same thing as being in Afghanistan and being in combat situations. But there are so many lessons that can be learned for the rest of us out there by the way that military conducts itself, by the way they run their culture, by at least the way they've set it up. And I I know that it's not perfect. Everyone is an imperfect person. We're humans, right? So just as we screw up as parents, I'm sure you've all screwed up as leaders in the military. But it's still a very attractive thing because the military has thought at such a detailed level of what this should look like, of what it looks like to bring someone up from not inferior, like you said, but from what was the word you used early in the entry level? So a subordinate Marine or a junior Marine. Yeah. From a very early, a subordinate who's, who's on their first day of basic or their first day of school up to a general sort of position. It's all the same culture and it's all the same buy-in and you're just, that's what you're doing. You're creating buy-in, you're creating trust. Yeah. You know, I was on, I'm actually flipping through some notes that I took a while ago. I was on a phone conference with one of our general officers And he talked about the difference between training and education. Training is for times of uncertainty. Education is for those uncertain times. And, you know, like you with your children, they're eventually going to move out. And you hope that they take those lessons learned that your goal was to instill in them. And for Marines, our education is never over. You know, I'm, like I said, 28 years, and I hate to keep throwing that number out there, but I say it because somebody else might listen to that and think, wow, he knows a thing or two about a thing or two. The only thing I know is that I've got so much more to learn. Sure. And, you know, I'm teaching in my current job, I'm teaching a a leadership and ethics class, and I am, as well as the professor, I am a student of the material. And the real shame of it is that I wish I had this passion for learning back when I was a second lieutenant or, you know, even before that, when I was at the Naval Academy, Mm -hmm. because it would have made me such a better equipped leader throughout my time. So, and that I think is one thing that the military does so well is that we continuously educate our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. So let's turn in the last step of this podcast to this physical side of this, the training. Good. I was wondering we were going to get to this. You have told me before in previous just conversations you and I were having certainly offline, how much you have loved and pursued fitness your entire career. It's, it's obvious that it wasn't just something that you were trying to meet the standard. It, it was obvious that you found a love of this, of the misery, of the training, of the actual doing the thing, right? Performing that PFT, you know, putting on the ruck and running like you've loved that stuff. Fair. Yes. <laughs> Very fair. And what role, I mean, from what I heard you say, is it's one of those things that seems like it's one of the ways that you can build camaraderie better than almost anything else among a group of Marines. That when you go out and suffer together, especially when you're a leader and your Marines will watch you suffer with them and watch you lead literally by example, is there anything you can do that's better at building camaraderie when not in combat than that? I would be hard pressed to give an example, but I'll tell you a little secret just between you and me and anybody else who's listening. Right. 10 or 12 people. Yeah. Two or three tops. It's me after all. I lost my way very early as a Marine officer. You know, when I was at the Naval Academy, I played sports and I was exceptionally mediocre at them. By the way, I love that term. And for people that have heard me get be interviewed. I've used a very similar term. I say I was painfully average at athletics growing up. (laughs) There is no more of a dubious honor than to be the captain of a junior varsity team. You're like the best of almost there, but not quite. That's right. That's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah. So in my exceptional mediocrity, you know, I always had the team and the coach and, you know, it sort of carried me through my four years at the Naval Academy. And then you know, fast forward, I'm at the basic school and I'm now a second lieutenant and there is no coach. Mm. It's okay. Here's the standard, figure it out. And I didn't figure it out. And when it came time to do our physical fitness test, I don't know if this will resonate, but I did not get a first class physical fitness test. Interesting. In fact, it was a second class score. And for the meat eating type A second lieutenants who are supposed to be hungry and and full of fire and vigor 
I fell, I passed. It's a passing score. Sure. But I just, I, I think it was one of the lowest scores in the entire training company. How much did that bother you? At the time, I think I was wallowing in it, so I didn't really see it for what it was. Mm. And then I showed up as a second lieutenant, my first command, and I was like, man, the uniform's kind of tight. You know, it must have been the dry cleaner. You know, it wasn't certainly <laughs> nothing that I've done. Right. And there was a moment when I realized I can't do this. Like, I walk in and people are looking at me going, you know, why am I going to follow him? He doesn't even look good in uniform. And, you know, at, this is the Marine Corps of 1994. So it was a little bit different than what we've got now. We've got a lot more structure. We've got a lot more programs that are available to our, our young Marines now. But, you know, I just did what, what I saw people around me doing. And I went running and running and running. And that's really where I figured out, okay, I'm not as bad as I thought I was. I just needed to bust the rust off. Mm. And then, you know, when I got to officer candidate school, that was where things got a little bit more balanced. I wasn't just endurance. I was a little bit more attuned to the rest of my body, if you will. But, you know, when you go out and work out with Marines, they want to see effort and they want to see, you know, they want to see somebody lead them. They don't want to question, why is this person in charge? They want to have that confidence like, well, of course he is or of course she is. Makes sense. It also makes sense. There's a book called Learning to Breathe Fire. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's really, it's like the history of CrossFit. And it's interesting how CrossFit exploded in 2008, 2007, somewhere in there when the soldiers were in Afghanistan and in Iraq, because it was that style of training that was like, it forced effort on everyone. You know, certainly you and I, have, we've talked about this off the air, that it is not the best way to train and it led to lots of injuries, but it fed that, I think, for them. So they, they could come out and they could pick up ammo cans and swing ammo cans like kettlebells and they could find the stuff that were laying around that they had, even if they didn't have access to barbells and still do the thing. And so, and I'm sure it built a tremendous amount of camaraderie among people. I, it exploded, I think, because of a lot of that. Absolutely. When you just run, and I learned this pretty early on, if two people go running together, one of them's really not getting all the benefit that they need. That's right. Because you're either running faster or slower than, you know, the other person. I think that's why, you know, for me, running was a very solitary activity. I, at the time, I enjoyed it because I was able to get out. I was able to clear my head. I was able to process information. And it was crazy. Once I cleared my mind, some of the things that would go through it, but it was me. And then, you know, unit runs are not meant for any physical benefit. I mean, there is some inevitable physical benefit, but you run as fast as your slowest individual. Sure. It's all about unit morale. Right. Uh, and that's why we call cadence. That's why we do things like that. But it's, it's not necessarily for the physical betterment of the command. When you've got something like you just talked about, whether it's high intensity tactical training or CrossFit or, you know, call it what you will, that is something you can do together in a confined space. That's where, quite honestly, that's where physical leaders emerge. And, you know, right or wrong, when a physically fit man or woman walks into a room, they have walk in the room credibility. That's right. And people sure. notice them and they're like, that is the poster Marine right there. And, you know, that's where it really starts, where people want to emulate. That's setting the example. They want to emulate the leader that they see and the training like that, whether it's hit or, or what have you, it enabled a lot of people to do a lot of exercise with equipment that was just laying around. So you told this story in the first episode of the series about how you have finally discovered we're really into running and eventually all of the high impact over the years of running started to beat your body up. Right. And you discovered, did you ever do CrossFit in that 2010 to 19 range before you found strength training? I don't mean to brag, but I am a CrossFit level one coach. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got it. So you did do that. So how many years did you do that at, you know, a, a moderate to intense level? So when I went to my CrossFit level one seminar, they were going around, they were like, Hey, you know, give us your name, how long you've been CrossFitting and you know what you hope to get out of this. And, you know, it was like, Hey, I'm Steve. I've been doing this for nine years and I'm Suzanne. I've been doing this for four years and it just went around the room and it got to me and I'm like, Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Scott. I've been doing this for, and I looked up at the clock. I'm like about an hour and a half now. <laughs> right. Right. And one of the seminar instructors was like, you're the one 
like there's always one somebody who comes in they have no experience for crossfit never done but, you it know, for me it was like yep. i i learned all the things the right way so incredibly difficult that is not an easy test by the way for anybody who's going for their level one certificate it's study that's all i can say before it was crossfit you know we do high intensity tactical training or hit i had been doing that uh, since about 2014, 2015, okay. uh, where I was getting more away from just running. But, you know, when you're over 40, it just means that more things hurt. Right. For me, for me, I'm not throwing stones at it for anybody out there who loves well, it. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying for me, it hurt. That's right. That's right. So, and then you turn, you told this story again in the first episode, you really turned to strength training, dedicated strength training in 2019. So over the last several years, and, you know, you have communicated to us that it has been one of the best things that you've done physically for your body to repair your body and put you in a position where you felt strong and healthy again. I had resigned myself to a return to my mediocrity, if you will. Um, and I mean, I don't mean to sound braggadocious. I just wanted to say the word braggadocious, but, you know, I've, I've done word. 10 marathons. I'm an Ironman triathlete. That was part of my identity. Sure. And when I couldn't do that anymore, I mean, it was to the point where I couldn't get up from my desk and walk down the passageway to the bathroom without limping. Yeah. And people are like, are, are you OK? And I'm like, no, it's just it's just who I am. Right. I had just resigned myself like this is it. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do after I retire, but I can't keep doing this. And I was about to get Achilles tendon surgery where they were going to cut the tendon off of my heel, you know, do some stuff and then bolt it back on. Yeah. And then I finally gave in because I had always thought you could be fit or you could be strong, right? but you can't do both. And one of the biggest mistakes I could have ever made was to think that way. And I finally gave in and I was like, let me see what resistance training is all about. And I put a barbell on my back and I realized I could lose weight doing barbell training. I could gain weight doing barbell training because it really had nothing to do with the weights. It had everything to do with, you know, the nutrition, finally eating came... correctly. Sure. And through all of my other endurance training, I never had a coach. And for the first time I had a coach. Now I, I'm not a client for barbell logic. Nope. This is not a, an endorsement for barbell logic. I just am a guest on the podcast. And the coach that I had was not a barbell logic coach, but she was a strength training coach. And I finally learned the right way to train and i got the fire back yeah i regained the passion for fitness and i realized at 49 years old i'm just getting started that's great so we've talked about the mental aspect of leadership we've talked about the impact that training together suffering together as a group how it builds trust here's my last major question for you on a personal level and then I'd like to pull back into kind of a 30,000 foot view. How has strength training over the last several years made you a better leader? Okay. I'm going to try to dance around this so it doesn't sound like I'm a pompous jerk. No. it's <laughs> The job I'm in right now, I am working with college students. They are 18 to 22 years old, and they are excited about what they're doing. I knew coming up here that it was not enough just to walk the walk or to look the part, I should say. Sure. I couldn't just show up and, eh, he looks pretty good in his uniform. I had to lead by example. I couldn't just show up at physical training. I had to, quite frankly, I had to dominate in physical training because I didn't want any of them to think it's enough just to get by. So I have been training, I mean, pretty, not even pretty consistently. I can count on the number of probably two fingers, how many programmed workouts I've missed in over two years. Yeah. And I mean, I made up for them, but these are just training days that I have missed. I have been absolutely consistent and one might even say relentless in my pursuit of physical training, because to me, leading when it's hard Sure. Put that in whatever context you want. In this situation, it's physical training, but leading when it's hard is the most important time. So when I'm out there with those students and we're doing physical training, if we're doing sprints, I want to win. 
And it's not that I want to beat them and rub their face in it, but I want them to be hungry. I want them to know what it's like to overcome a challenge and to finally beat the old man. You know, I want them to think I'm 22 years old and this 50 year old is out here, you know, he's getting it done. And I want them to see the effort and I want them to see that commitment and I want them to see the passion that I put into it because that's just one aspect of my leadership. And I want them to see that carry over into all the other aspects. But for me, the physical training field is the most visible demonstration of that effort mm. and that passion and the accomplishments that, that we all strive for. Yeah, it's great. It's easy. I mean, I can say this instead of putting the words in your mouth that if you pull back to that 30,000 foot view, you can see how the direct impact that strength training can have actually, in fact, not just military leaders, but leadership across the board. Like, I think this is why we train as parents. I think this is why we train as bosses and CEOs. I think this is like, it's the same thing, right? We have to do this. You know, in many of the other episodes in this series, we've talked about the value of strength training for the soldier or Marine or whatever you are. <laughs> and so <laughs> soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines, all of them and our Coast Guardsmen too. Yes, all of those things. That's right. But it is interesting that you call that. It really comes back to the idea of voluntary hardship, right? We're leading, we're choosing to do a thing we don't have to do that is hard and do it well while most of the rest of the Western world sits on their couch and watches Netflix and eats junk. And we understand the value that it provides on not just a physical level, certainly a physical level, but on a mental and emotional and social and a trust building level as well. It's really a, right. it has direct impact on all those. You know, you call it voluntary hardship, and I think that's a great way to describe it. But one of the best leadership lessons I've learned, and it's so simple, if there's a line for something good, get in back. Yep. If there's a line for something hard, get in front. That's right. That's right. You know, Simon Sinek says, you know, use the term leaders eat last. In the Marine Corps, I eat last. Yeah. Dead last. And if there's nothing left, you know, I don't get but I need to make sure that I take care of my people, you know, the young men and women who have been placed in my charge. I mean, that's my sacred responsibility. And that's the trust. And that's the voluntary hardship. And that's what gets people to respond. And that's what gets them to do the things that I've asked them to do, not because I told them, but because I've hopefully inspired them to want to do it. That's great. Yeah. And I love it. You can continue to do the strength training into your 50s and 60s. And when your body and your body's really kind of there, you're not able, you probably couldn't go out. Well, let me say that again. Your conditioning is such that you could probably go out and run a marathon, but your body will not let you probably run too many more marathons in your career, right? Your ankles, your Achilles, your knees, your hips. It's not going to be happy with that. It's always on the list of things that I am considering. Yes. I haven't ruled anything out, uh, you know, up to and including Iron Man. Well, and I think you could do it. I want to coach this time. <laughs> Would you publicly state at least that like your body probably isn't going to like it? No, it will not. Um, yeah. The But it's still choosing to do something hard. I mean, how hard right. is a marathon? How hard is an Iron Man? Good grief. Yeah. Those things are insane. If I'm honest, the Marine Corps physical fitness test, you know, is a three mile run pull-ups and crunches. Men of a certain age, I should say men and women of a certain age, uh, the Marine Corps has just gone to a system where we can row, you know, get on a concept two and pull 5,000 meters. Yep. And I want to thank whoever proposed that in, in the meeting where the decision was made because the impact of three miles, I mean, that sure. takes a toll for a couple of days. Sure. You know, whereas now, you know, like you said, a marathon would a marathon would hurt. Sure. I get on the concept too. I get off after a 5K. You know, I'm good. I'm good for the rest of that day. Sure. There's no impact on a C2 road. So, but yeah, absolutely. So for me, strength training has enabled me, and I'm telling you, I'm still turning in 300 perfect scores for my physical fitness test and my combat fitness test. And I owe a lot of that to strength training yes. because it's taken the pain away from physical training for me. Sure. Sure, it's built the muscles up around the joints so that the joints don't have to bear all the load. All the science stuff that you talk about. That's right. And one of the things we're really careful about at Barbell Logic, and again, I know you're not advocating this specifically with Barbell Logic and you want to be careful there, but for us, there are physical fitness tests in every branch of service. It is our goal to help those people improve their physical fitness scores. That's for another episode on another day, we can argue what should the physical fitness test be for those people enrolled in the military. 
but that is the standard. And so we have to work towards getting better there. But one of the things that we can do in, in the entire holistic W-H-O-L program for someone is to help them become stronger and better and do that with voluntary hardship. And I think that the day is coming and the military is certainly moving this direction, it seems, that they're starting to adopt more strength training pieces. And I think it's because it helps make soldiers better. It helps make them healthier. You have lower injury rates. Like all of these things are better restraint. And oh, by the way, it still fulfills and checks off that box of voluntary hardship, of suffering together, of training together, of getting better together. And so the army is doing their new army combat fitness test. They've got the trap bar deadlift in there. That's right. You know, so uh, they are absolutely looking at an expression of physical strength. And, you know, again, I, I'm not advocating for or advertising for Barbell Logic, but I do know a thing or two about your company and I do listen to your podcast. And I remember you in the conversation with Nikki and Andrew talking about training versus exercise. And a point that you made was if you take a golfer and he stops golfing for, you know, six, eight months, puts on, you know, 15, 20 pounds of muscle. Yes. Strength training will fundamentally change the golf swing. That's right. So would six to eight months off from a golf club. But if you incorporate, and for me, in my training, incorporating strength training to all the other things, it has just made me a better athlete. Which is great when you're 67 years old like you are. Thank you for that. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Age catches up with everybody, so have fun with it. Well, I mean, that's the fun of the leadership kind of growth over the course of your career, right? Is that it's crazy that as you get older and older, your body gets a little more beat up. The stuff that you can't do, the stuff you did when you're 21 years old, although strength training, I think, preserves that pretty well. But what you build is you build a life of experience and wisdom and knowledge. And so you end up walking this often inverse relationship between the physical strength and the mental strength. And one of the things that we're trying to do on a daily basis, and one of the things I've watched you do is you've been able to preserve the physical strength while continuing to improve over the decades, your mental fortitude and wisdom. No, we haven't said the word yet on this podcast, but resilience is an absolutely intended consequence of the training that I do. That's right. You know, if you just look at the definition of resilience, you know, the ability to bounce back from hardship, you know, in your term, this voluntary hardship, it has made me just more than what I would call a middle-aged athlete. It makes me a healthier human. You know, I can, yeah. I can walk downstairs without snap, crackle, and pop. That's right. You know, I can pick something up that's heavy. I can shovel snow as you do in Vermont, and I'm not broken for two days afterwards, which is good because it's Vermont and it's going to snow again tomorrow. That's right. Yeah, it builds that anti-fragility. Every aspect of my life is impacted by this and it makes me a much more resilient person and it makes me a more resilient leader. That's awesome. Hey, man, thank you again for being on the show. Thanks for your contributions over the course of this series. It's been super helpful and super informative for me. It's been fun to just learn talking to people about the way you do life in the Marines and the way the culture is. And it's so interesting to me. And there's so many takeaways for me as someone who's not ever been in the service, but there's still so many lessons to be learned. So thank you so much for sharing those stories. Everybody does their part. You know, I happen to do what I do for a living and you do what you do for a living and we're all part of a bigger system. So I appreciate you having me on. It's been a, a great hour of course. and uh, I look forward to keeping in touch over time. Absolutely. Thanks again. Hey, thank you for listening. We've got one more episode in the military podcast coming up on specifically Nikki Sims is going to dive down that culture path and talk a little bit more about how culture is affected tremendously by strength training and what that does for us at the cultural level. So stay tuned for the next one. And again, thanks for listening. Love a five-star review. If you haven't uh, given us one in the past and the podcast brings you value, please do that. And please share this with a uh, member of the service. If they haven't been exposed to this stuff, that would be super helpful for us. Let's help people be better soldiers and Marines and airmen and sailors. I got it. All for it. Well done. <laughs> All right. We'll talk soon. <laughs>